If you'll get your Bibles and turn to Joshua chapter 7. Joshua. It's right before Judges. Joshua chapter 7. And Joshua 7 is right after Joshua 6. It's like it keep it simple for everybody. We probably all played hide and go seek or hide and seek. I don't know what you call it. We called it hide and go seek when I was growing up. But we've played as kids and maybe we've played with uh, our grandkids and it's just a fun thing to do. We used to play with a dog. We used to, we would go hide. We had a little miniature poodle and we would, we would, somebody would hold him in the back of the house and and we would go hide in somewhere in the front of the house. And, oh, he wanted, that. He wanted to lose so bad because he loved to play. And then we'd let him go. And, man, he was fast. And he could find you every time. The only thing, it was interesting because he would look everywhere. He would look, it'd be a little garbage, and he would look in there to see if you're hiding in the garbage. He'd even go to the commode and look over in the commode to see if you're hiding in there. He would find you, though. But I love to play that like with kids, and it's fun to watch kids because they, they're trying to hide, and all of a sudden, you know, okay, and you're counting, and then, and then you go look for them, and they're right in the middle of the room like this, <laughs> and they think you can't see them. Uh, another fun thing is like we'll be, we'll be playing or something with our little grandkids, or we have, you know, they're growing up so fast, but we'll go hide with one of them. And, uh, and then, okay, be quiet, be quiet now. And then here comes somebody looking. And then they start squealing because they're so excited and, and give it away. But, uh, but it's fun. Today we're looking at a guy that was hiding, and, uh, but it's not so fun. He's hiding something. He's taken something, and he's hiding it. And he thinks he's hiding it and how, how foolish it is when we try to hide anything from God. Amen. I mean, how foolish is that? Um, and yet we do sometimes. But the Bible says, be sure your sins will what? Will find you out. So I want to bring a message this morning entitled, The Futility of Hidden Sin. You have an outline on the back of your bulletin. And let me sort of just, just uh, get a little running start here. Israel, and I'll just remind you, has just been, uh, had the greatest conquest in their history as they see the walls of Jericho come down, and we talked about that. Those things 12 feet thick and 6 feet, another wall, and 30 feet high, 20 feet high. I mean, those, they're just huge, and they're, they're around Jericho. There's just no way. It was the most fortified city, and yet God gave them total victory. I mean 100% victory. And that's what's just happened. So they're no doubt thinking that there can't anything stop them now. They're going to go from victory to victory to victory. By the way, that's the study we're in. Victory to victory. That's what God wants for you and me. And let me say this. If you're a Christian, if you're a born-again believer, his plan for you is to go from victory to victory daily. Now, I didn't say you won't have some trouble. I didn't say you won't have some tribulation. But he still wants you to go through victory to victory to victory. And that is God's plan no matter what's going on in your life. And so everything looks great. They think it's going to be a string of victories. But there's a guy who's playing hide and seek. He's hidden something. And he thinks he's going to get by with it. His name's Achan. And let me just say this. If you don't, again... I'm just remind us, don't just think this is just a history lesson here. Because every one of us, every person in this room, and I don't even know some of you hardly at all, but I know this, you've hidden something before. You've hidden some sin before. We start out when we're just little kids, and we don't want our parents to find out. We've all done that. But how foolish it is, especially to try to hide something from God. So I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm just going to read one verse here. So stand in honor of God's word. And let's just read the first verse. And then you can be seated. Verse 1 says, but the children, it says, but. But the children of Israel committed a trespass 
in the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, uh, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now, the cursed thing or the accursed thing is something that's been banned. It's something that's off limits. And he took something that he was not supposed to take. Thank you. Please be seated. So the first thing I want you to put down in your notes is this. We'll look at three things. We see a painful defeat. We see a painful defeat. Let's read just a few more verses. Verse 2 says, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up. But let about two or 3,000 men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for they are they're but a few. So there went up thither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about 36, 30 and 6 men, and they chased them from before the gate even unto Shabarim, And smote them in the going down. In other words, coming down the cliffs of Shabaram, they were smote 36. Wherefore, the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Israel is is still, and just let me just remind you, they're enjoying this victory. And they see nothing but green lights. They see nothing but positive and bright future. It's all good. So they didn't see this coming that they're going to be defeated. But I do want to tell you something. They're living at this juncture before they go to Ai. They're in a dangerous place. And here's, here's, here's why I say that. When you're coming off of a spiritual high, a spiritual victory, if you will, great place, everything's just phenomenal. Look out. It can be a very dangerous time. And that's exactly what happened here. Um, one of the reasons I want to say that is because pride, pride steps forth. And the Bible says pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So let me really tell you what the problem is. Confidence is a good thing, Right? It's a good thing to have confidence, but not in the wrong place. These guys were just dripping with confidence. I mean, we can't even hardly imagine what it must have been like. They saw the greatest victory ever, and they'd just seen the Jordan opened up. I mean, they're just seeing these victories, and it's it's like confidence is is just coming out. It's just oozing out of these people. It's awesome. But their confidence is in the wrong place. You see, they have confidence in themselves. And it wasn't, it wasn't themselves. They didn't do anything to win Jericho. All they did were obedient. That's all they did. God gave that victory. Totally. They didn't do anything to get the Jordan to open up. God did that. But yet they're the ones that get overconfident. And, uh, and, and therein lies a problem. So let me give you three things real quick. I didn't put this in your notes, but let me just mention three things that they, you could call them mistakes, missteps, whatever. Here they are. The first one I just gave it to you. Their confidence is in their own power and their own strength. That's a problem. And let me say this today. You may be a very confident person, but your confidence better be in the Lord. It better not be in your own talent and your own ability, and your own money, and your, your own uh, career, and your own whatever, your, your common sense, or your brain, or what. It better not be in any of that. It better be in the Lord Jesus Christ, because he can remove any of that any time, or all of that. And he has done it many times. 
So our confidence better be in the Lord. Secondly, there is nowhere in this passage that even hints that Joshua or the people of Israel sought God before they went to Ai. Now, before that, they were totally waiting on God. I mean, the Jordan was at flood stage. They didn't know what to do. They're totally waiting on God. They didn't run away. They said they didn't say, no, 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 we can't do this. They waited on God, right? And he blessed. And then there's Jericho. There were 18 days. They're they're praying. They're worshiping. He said, wait, they're waiting. They did whatever God said. And then they followed his formula, and God gave them total victory. But now, they don't wait on God. Joshua says, and Joshua's a great man, but listen, we all, no matter who you are, you can make missteps. And he did. He sent these men, go check out Ai and see what's what. And they did. And they come back and they say, we don't even need nearly all of our people. They didn't need near, I mean a tenth. Two or three thousand people will do it. This is a small place. And guess what? Joshua says, okay, let's go. Big, big mistake. The third thing I see, they didn't take the ark, the ark of the covenant. The ark of the covenant was with them and in front of them when they go through the Jordan. Why do you say, what's the, what's the big deal? Because the ark is God's presence. The ark is God's power. And when they go to Jericho and they're marching around those, those cities, right? The ark is there. The ark is front and center. But no ark now. What were they saying? In, 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 a, in essence, they're saying we don't really need God's presence. Not that I don't think they would have purposefully come out and said, but by not inviting him and not waiting on him, that's what they were doing. This is, this is a serious thing. No wonder they were defeated. You know, if you put God first and you seek God, and you wait on God, listen, you can, you can claim Philippians 4.13 where it says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Just don't ever remove Christ because without him you can do nothing, and I can do nothing. So anyway, let's, let's, uh, let's see what's next. After their terrible defeat, huh? this is interesting. Look at verse 5 and see if it sounds familiar. It says, Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Does that sound familiar? That's the same thing that, that the spies found out about the people of Jericho. Remember when they went and spied out and Rahab? The, the, our hearts, Rahab told them, our hearts melt within us. In other words, we're, these, these people of Jericho, they're scared to death. And now they're saying the same thing. And this is God's people. And they're feeling the same way. They, they feel the same fear. And they don't even know what's wrong yet. They don't even know what's, they don't know why they lost 36 people. They don't know why they had to go running away from this little place called Ai. But you know who knows? God knew. He knew exactly what was going on. So we see a painful defeat. But number two, write this. We see a painful discovery. We see a painful discovery. Now, Joshua does a good thing. Here's a tragedy, and he goes to the Lord in prayer. That's a good thing. But I'm going to read this scripture, and you see if you, you, you just notice a hint of accusation in his voice. Verse 6, Joshua rent his clothes, fell to the earth upon his face before the ark, again, before the ark of the Lord until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. That's the right thing to do. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Uh Uh-oh, little bit of accusation. Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. A little bit of anger right there. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before the enemies? For the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us around or surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto unto thy great name? He's concerned about God's reputation, which is a good thing. But there's two things I want to share here. Number one, 
prayer, and it, he did pray, and that's good. But prayer, I want everybody to get this. Prayer's not going to do any good if there's sin in our life. It's not. You can just pray and pray all you want to. But if there's sin in your life, God doesn't hear. Psalm 66, 18, write it down. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Isaiah 59, 2 says almost the same thing. There's sin, and so God is not going to answer this prayer. The second thing that we see here is that he's sort of blaming God. God, why'd you bring us? You, basically, what you say, it's, just, it's your fault. What'd you do this for? What'd you do this to us for? It's going to hurt your reputation. God, what are you doing? Can I just give you one little nugget here? If you make a decision and things don't go right, don't blame people. Don't blame somebody else. We live in a culture that blames everybody for everything. Have y'all noticed that? I mean, it's culture's fault. It's society's fault. It's, it's the school's fault. It's the principal's fault. It's, it's my, my parents' fault. It's somebody else's fault. Listen, it's me. It's me standing in the need of prayer. Don't blame somebody else. And whatever you do, don't blame God. Don't blame God. And that's, that's kind of what Joshua's doing. He doesn't even know what's going on, but he's, he's sort of blaming God for whatever it is. When there's a lack of power in, in your life, it's your fault, not God's. If there's a lack of power and God's presence in the church, it's my fault, it's your fault, it's our fault. It's not God's. Boy, can I hear an amen? I hope everybody knows that. I didn't think I was going out on a limb on that one. So God reveals the problem, there's sin in the camp. And I did put this in your notes. Let me give you seven insights concerning sin and its effects. I'll go through them quickly. Number one, God knows about our sins. You might as well talk to God about your sin. Let me say that again. You might as well talk to God about your sin because he already knows about it. If you don't talk to him, don't think that he does, maybe he won't know about it. He already knows about it. You might as well talk to him about it. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Uh, I'll let you in on a little secret. He knows the good you do too, but he knows the evil. Secondly, God hates our sin. And let me just emphasize hate. He hates our sin. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, just to give you one example, Proverbs 6, 16, these six things to the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination to him, a proud look. Lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, feet that be swift and run into mischief, on and on. There's, God hates sin. The third thing, God has a plan for our sins. And that's important because we're all sinners. Somebody says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm saved. Well, you're still a sinner. We're all sinners. So here's the plan, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Fourthly, God will punish our sins. Don't think you're getting by with it any more than Achan's going to get by with it. Look at verse 15. It shall be that, when he, that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire he and all that he hath because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. God will punish sin. Number five, sin affects those around you. Don't think you're going to sin in a vacuum. You hear people say this, well, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not hurting anybody. Yes, you are. First of all, you're hurting yourself. But it's not just you. Well, I'm not hurting anybody else. Yes, you are. You're all, you can't sin in a vacuum. You always are affect, affecting other people. You're affecting your spouse. You're affecting your children. You're affecting your, 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 your family. 
your church. See, we have to examine ourselves and make sure there's not sin in our, because God, God will, he will withhold his blessing even from the church. You know why I say that? Because every person in here who is a born-again believer and, and is part of this church, if there's sin in the camp, you're going to see they lost because of one man's sin. We need God's blessing. We need his power. So we've got to examine our, make sure there's no sin in our life. It affects all of those around us. And then number six, sin hinders God's work. Look at verse 12. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies. In other words, they ran because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. And number seven, sin must be dealt with. Sin must be dealt with. You either deal with your sin or God will. It's as simple as that. Sin must be dealt with. I don't know if any of you remember a guy. About, it's over 40 years ago when he died. His name John Belushi. Anybody remember John Belushi? He died in the spring of 1983. Hard to believe. 40, 40 years ago. He died of, a, of cocaine and heroin overdose. Well, when he died... U.S. News and World Report put out an article on the sed uh, seductive dangers of cocaine. And I just want to read a couple of sentences that they wrote, okay? And see what you get out of this. Here's what they say about the dangers of cocaine. It can do you no harm, and it can drive you insane. It can give you status in society, and it can wreck your career. It can make you the life of the party, and it can turn you into a loner. It can be an elixir for high living and a potion for death. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, what I got when I read that, it sounds like cocaine, heroin, and whatever, you got a 50-50 chance. I mean, it can be awesome or it can be devastating. I got news for you. It's always devastating. Always. Oh, there may be pleasure in sin for a season. The Bible tells us that. But the wages of sin is what? It's death. It's death. And, you know, I was thinking about this after him. There have been many, 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 many stars and musicians and on and on who have OD'd or, or died in a drunken stupor of something. You know, on and on. I could have used so many examples. The wages of sin is death. So we see a painful defeat, a painful discovery, and thirdly, we see the death. We see a painful death. Now, God knew who was guilty. And I thought about this before. Why didn't he just, why didn't he just tell Joshua? Why didn't he tell Joshua before they ever went to Ai? Wait, 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 Joshua, don't go yet. Don't go. Be, take a step back. Wait a minute. Why didn't he do that? Well, the same reason he doesn't stop you from sinning and me from sinning. He gives us a free will. He doesn't force himself on anybody. But then there's another question. Now the, 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 the devastation has already happened. Why doesn't, he tell, why doesn't he just tell Joshua who it is? He didn't. He didn't. Joshua doesn't know. And so, why didn't he just tell him? Here's why I think on that one. I think he was given Achan an opportunity to confess and repent. Because God loves, he loved Achan. He loves, he loves us even when we sin, he still loves us. 
He still loves us. And he loved Achan. So he wants Achan to, to repent. The lesson here is clear. God is long-suffering. He's patient. He's kind. He's compassionate. But he won't wait forever. Achan's going to be destroyed. The Bible says it this way in Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to, the, to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Achan was sowing to his flesh and he didn't repent. Be sure your sins will find you out. So when Joshua speaks to Achan, here's something that's kind of sweet. Joshua speaks with love in his heart. He knows that Achan is condemned, but he still cares about him. You know, we've been talking about this on Wednesday night. We still love no matter what. If you're a Christian, we love people. We love people. No matter what they've done, we still love them. And that's the way God is. He loved Achan. And Joshua loved Achan. That's a mark of a good, great leader, actually. Well, let's read it in verse 19. It says, Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell him now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. Achan finally confesses. Why? Because he was caught. But he didn't repent. He's kind of like Pharaoh. Pharaoh would, would not truly repent. Um, Balaam would not truly repent. Judas, how about Judas? Judas. Oh, he was sorry. He threw the money down, didn't he? Then he went and hung himself. He didn't truly repent. We have to make sure that when we, when we sin, we don't, we're not just sorry. Listen, 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 everybody. I'm almost done. I want you to get this, though. We've got to make sure that we truly repent, not just confess, not just be sorry. We truly repent. What does that mean? That means I don't do it anymore. I am sorry. I do confess. But I'm not going to do that anymore. No matter what, I, I, I go away from that. That's true repentance. When I repent and come to Christ, I am, I am publicly turning from anybody else and anything else. I'm saying, look, I can't be good enough. My works won't cut it. I can't. My religion won't cut it. I have to have a Savior. His name is Jesus. There is no other way. That's what true repentance. I, I repent of sin and I turn to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of my life. You could say it this way. I'm putting all my eggs in one basket. It's Jesus Christ. It's him crucified. He died for me. He's the only one that died for me. There is no other way. Listen, Baptist isn't going to save anybody. Church membership is not going to save anybody. Catholicism not going to save anybody. It's Jesus. Jesus Christ and him alone. I've got to turn to him. All right, let me, let me give you the last thing. Look at verse 21. And if you, if you, if you underline in your Bible, I'm going to give you three things to underline. First, he says in verse 21, when I saw, underline, I saw. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I, underline this, coveted. Underline coveted. I saw and then I coveted. I coveted them and then and took them and underline that. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of the tent and the silver under it. Here's what he says. I saw, I coveted, I took. Do you know that's the same pattern in the Garden of Eden? Go all the way back to Genesis. And Eve saw. Wow, it does look good. And coveted and took. And now we're in the mess we're in. <laughs> Ever since. 
David, he saw Bathsheba and he coveted and took. It's the same thing. And you and I have been party to the same type thing from time to time. I saw, I coveted, I took. It's, it's the progression uh, or the digression of sin. It's the pattern of sin. James 1.15 gives it to us. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what? Death. Death. And what's the result? 36 guys die. Not only that, Achan dies. Not only that, his spouse dies. Not only that, his children die. All of that death. That's the result of sin. That's, the, that's always the result. Listen. That's always the result of unrepentant sin. So if a person, it can be my, my, my brother, my, my cousin. It can be my closest friend. It, it can be whoever. If they refuse Jesus Christ... They could be the most religious, good person as far as society is concerned. But if they refuse Jesus Christ as Savior, they will die in their trespasses and sin. It's sad, but it's true. The wages of sin is death. There's no need for anyone to perish. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Isn't that something? And people want to blame God for sending people to hell. No, he did everything. He did everything to keep anyone from going to hell. If you're here today and you know Jesus Christ as Savior, praise his name. But if you have unconfessed, unrepentant sin in your life, then repent. Confess it, repent. If you're here, you do not know positively if you fall down dead today that you're going to heaven. Get saved today. The opportunity, the invitation is here today. Get it settled today. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. The futility of hidden sin. What a shame to try to hide anything from God. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would have your will and your way in this time. If there's anybody lost, I pray they get saved today, even right now. Lord, if we need any of us, all of us need to make a decision, I pray that you would help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.